My name is Jordan Winkenbach. I'm a senior forestry student here at UWSP. I'm president of the Coalition of Organizational Leadership in the CNR. And I'm Kelly Adlington. I'm a junior waste management student at UWSP, and I'm the president of uh, Students for Sustainability. And our organizations are two of several that were involved with bringing uh, Nate Higgins, Peter McCoy, and Passion to campus in honor of Earth Week this year. Um, just so you all know, because there was a lot of hard work that went into planning this series of events, um, this group of organizations consisted of Society for Ecological Restoration, Students for Wetland Awareness Management Protection, Waste Management Society, Environmental, Envi Environmental and Sustainability Issues Committee, Save the Frogs, Her Herpetology Society, 350, Land Conservation Society, American Water Resources Association, Soil and Water Conservation Society, Fire Crew, and Entrepreneurship Club. So there was a lot of planning that went into this months ago. different people but this was a student initiative and we're pretty lucky to be able to do something like this here. Um, so these speakers um, have been part of a larger series of events in honor of Earth Week this year and the Office of Sustainability has put together a really great calendar listing all those events so you should be sure to check that out um, so you don't miss anything by the end of the week. <clears throat> so in 2011 Passion Marie founded or co-founded Detroit Dirt which is a grassroots company that is taking abandoned land in Detroit and turning it into urban farmland. Since then, she has been actively changing the carbon footprint of that city by revitalizing community-based agriculture. And so we've got a quick little video that'll kind of introduce you to what she's all about. Um, this is a commercial she did with Ford. So I don't know uh, who here has seen it. Awesome, so we'll get a lot of brand new views. <laughs> so hard. For what? For this? For dirt? Other countries, they work, they stroll to the market and buy locally grown food. Locally. Why aren't we like that? Well, more and more of us are like that. Because we're crazy entrepreneurs trying to make the world better. Some people might think we're nuts. Whatever. Me? I collect food scraps from restaurants. Manure from zoos. Manure. Do you know why? To keep this stuff out of landfills and use it to make good, rich dirt. That's why. Yeah, look, it's pretty simple. You work hard, you believe that anything is possible, and you try to make the world better. You try. As for helping the city grow good, green, healthy vegetables, that's the upside of giving a damn. Mess pop. campus tonight, so if you'll join us and welcome her up on stage. Well, thank you. My name is Tasha Murray, and I'm so uh, elated about being here. Um, this has been somewhat of a spiritual journey for me because I'm starting to be invited to communities all over the country, and I'm seeing this movement really uh, change and, and shift, and truly, uh, I believe that this was um, a cultural thing where we needed to switch gears, and uh, the Ford ad is one of the opportunities, or many of the opportunities that I've had to um, at least tell my story. And then we did another film recently. Um, the Hollywood community is starting to help push the movement as well. And, and the soil story uh, has been a, um, a really fun piece where other celebrities and different folks from around the world are um, lending their voice and a helping hand in the movement. So I'm very excited to be here and very grateful. And, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how Detroit Dirt came about and um, some of the relationships I've built along the way and the process.
progress that we're making and what the future holds. And so um, I'll try to fit everything in in about 20, 25 minutes and then try to open up the Q&A uh, for those who are interested or have questions. Um, so. So you guys can hear me, right? <laughs> All right, good. Okay. All right. So um, before we go into my story, I just want to talk a little bit about this epidemic around food waste. Um, so Americans dis dispose food that is never eaten, amounting to 218 billion dollars annually. I'm going to read that one time because you guys should be like, oh, ooh. Americans dispose food that is never eaten, amounting to $218 billion annually. Ooh. There we go, you're awake. <laughs> so for me, that is like mind blowing, seriously, because at the end of the day, that that's unharvested food, that's restaurant food, that's the food in our households. That's a lot of that's a lot of money. Two hundred and eighteen million dollars. Fifty-two million tons of wasted food is sent to landfills each year. Ten million tons is left in the fields. So one of my mentors, he was like, "We should give people a picture of what that really looks like, Passion." So he <laughs> thought about showing a Boeing that's seven hundred and forty-seven, a seven hundred forty-seven weighs seventy-five tons. So he was thinking about like. Think about how many planes that is. Let's start giving visuals to the audience. And so, as we were meeting, we were thinking about what those tons really look like. And then, how many times it would be wrapped around the Earth's equator. I mean, that's a lot of waste. One in seven Americans are food insecure. Food waste fills 21 to 25% of landfills, and it kind of varies throughout the country. Uh, 5.6 billion could be saved annually by cutting spending on food that is never eaten. Think of all the wasted water, energy, on farm labor, fuel and transportation, distribution, processors, etc., etc. So. All of my life, I've been involved in the food system and waste, some kind of way. Um, I never imagined as a young child that I'd be standing in front of audiences talking about waste management and, and the food epidemic as well as the fragmented systems that make up our food system. I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is just two hours west of Detroit. My dad owned a company that focused on, really the city and the county contracted with him um, for waste removal, industrial, um, plow mowing, snow plowing, landscaping, interior demolition. So I grew up jumping in and out of trucks with him as a kid going to the landfills. And just to be honest with you, that never made sense. I've been saying that all day, that even as a child, riding in that, that dump truck or that pickup truck or whatever kind of truck it was, going to the landfills never made sense. Because in the late 80s and 90s, we're climbing up these hills so these bulldozers and front loaders are creating a layer and burying, creating a layer, and it went on and on and on and on. And part of my childhood in the summers, I grew up spending a two or three weeks in Mississippi um, at my family's farm. So I watched my grandfather at six o'clock in the morning go out in the fields. He knew everything that was going on. And the tree was suffering if an animal was sick, you name it. So during that journey and that path, as I was getting older and learning more and more about the environment and protecting the earth, 
I was learning, but it never really was a priority. It was just a part of my life. And when I had the opportunity to move back home after my undergraduate studies at Texas Southern, um, I went away at 18, came back when I was around 24, and Grand Rapids was investing millions of dollars into sustainability and sustainable practices. They were integrating programs into the local colleges and universities. A lot of the construction companies uh, were allocating dollars uh, to bring USGBC into the city as well as getting designers and construction management companies. Um, you know, architects, I've never seen so many people from so many different industries coming together for one cause. And that was to build a better city. So within that landscape, there were abandoned schools that were turned into lofts or apartments. Uh, there were rooftop gardens that were being um, implemented in, uh, to some of the buildings. Uh, a lot of the buildings that were being uh, built from the ground up uh, were gold and silver and platinum um, according to LEED standards. The hospitals were starting to think about how they could be more efficient. And so I watched over a year and a half our city kind of transition into a new city. And my father at the time was still focused in on, you know, waste. And that's what he was used to that created a, a living for our family, but here I come being young, coming out of business school, telling my dad, we need to redirect. And he's looking at me like, what do you mean? This is what we've been doing. What are you talking about? And I started explaining to him the future and what we needed to be doing differently. And so at the time, I had an opportunity to um, partner with another local uh, company that was recycling sawdust. And we came together, merged the equipment, and I bid it on a contract with the city of Grand Rapids for the YMCA, which is, I believe it's silver. I believe it's silver or gold. I couldn't remember uh, the certification that I got. But that was the pivotal moment for me when my friend's parents started allowing me to attend these Green Building Council meetings. So I got an opportunity to see the future a little bit and think about how I could change something that my dad had built and turn it into something that could be mine, but also at the same time value those practices and integrate them into the businesses that he had created. So <laughs> honestly, we didn't get along at that point. And that's why I started my own company. And when I had the opportunity to bid on that contract and I got it, that gave me, as a young person, that's why I'm always telling people, students and young people, put your mind to it, have the faith. You can do whatever it is that you put your mind to. Um, when I got that opportunity, it completely revolutionized my thought process. Because being that kid going to the landfills, burying waste, was yesterday. The future it was looking at the waste stream, putting a dollar value on it, and being a leader at a young age who stepped up to say, I don't want to be involved in those practices of yesterday. It's about the future. There are companies in the community that can use the steel scraps the wood, the cement, everything that was coming on and off of that property, I had to manage those materials and take data and be held responsible for where all those materials were going. And once that happened, it changed my life. I knew that I would be involved in sustainability for, for the rest of my life. And so with that said, that gave me an opportunity to start consulting. Um, it gave me an opportunity to get uh, students to think about their future. 
it just gave me a completely different life. And once I got an opportunity to start lobbying, I knew that going to D.C. was not the answer for me. I'm just not cut out for <laughs> fighting uh, for policy. There are other people in the world who are equipped for that, but it did give me an understanding and a perspective about oil, money, <laughs> versus the environmental dollars. You know what I mean? What was allocated for environmental, it was just unbelievable. It was not even a fraction of what was out there for the lobby, you know, the lobbyists who were pushing oil, 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 oil. It was just unbelievable. It's completely lopsided around policy in, in, in Washington, D.C. for environmental causes. And I can't believe <laughs> that um, there's that significant, there's that much of a difference for people who want to fight for what's right and those who want to continue to push for tobacco and oil. I mean, you can't even compare the environmental dollars that are allocated for those initiatives. It's just unbelievable. So for me, it was about being an entrepreneur and being on the ground, coming together with people in the community who are grassroots. And so my main priority became changing the carbon footprint of Detroit by revitalizing neighborhoods and finding solutions and eliminating waste. The whole purpose was to create a closed loop model. A closed loop model that in, in, um, involved waste. And if you would have asked me six or seven years ago if it would have been an automotive company that would have helped me overcome that hurdle of getting the city to pay attention to their waste stream, I probably would have laughed because there's no way I would have thought an automotive company Cars need gas, they need fuel. So I wouldn't think that a GM or Ford or Chrysler would be interested in anything involving environmental. But what I learned was I started doing my research and Henry Ford owned thousands of acres of farmland. This was part of his mission. The assembly line and the car came later on, but for years, he employed the youth through farming. That's what a lot, how a lot of jobs were created through farming, and Michigan was an agricultural hub. And so I started doing research, and I met a couple of people along the way, and um, I found out that the automotive industry had a supplier partnership uh, organization. And that organization was dedicated to sustainable initiatives, um, creating car parts that were eco-friendly, building eco-friendly cars, building efficient and more efficient cars for the future. And in that room, all of the people who were present were products or were helping to create products for the automotive industry off of the waste stream alone which blew my mind completely, because that went from like 50 companies to now like 300 companies. And the conversation was all about how do we make a difference, because we were dependent on the car for so long in Detroit that we were the reason why there was an economic downturn, because we didn't diversify the market. Agriculture should have always been a priority in Michigan. As much land as we have that's vacant, there's no way we should have abandoned agriculture. And so once those conversations, I started getting invited to the table to talk about you know, what the role of the automotive industry could play with what I was doing, because all of the conversation was mostly about the car. I'm like, you guys feed thousands of people. You gotta think about a General Motors. It has like 200 suppliers. When you see a car, there's like 200 companies involved or 100 companies involved in making that car work properly. So if all of them have cafeterias, 
and they're feeding people on a day-to-day, -day, we need to be talking about where the food waste is going. Not just where the steel and the plastics are going, but where's the food waste going? And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the beginning of my journey for Detroit Dirt. And I haven't looked back since. So there are tons of projects like this picture right here. This is on the rooftop, and they're evolving the rooftops and a lot of vacant properties throughout the city. But what we realize is that if we could create a model and get a couple of major corporations from the community involved, then the rest of the city would follow. And when we were regenerating or creating this movement and increasing the awareness and action, you'll be amazed at how many people started coming out of the community because they just didn't know how to help. You know, a lot of people want to help. No one wants to continue to do redundant things that aren't making a contribution, but we had to provide a way and we had to create organizations where people could come out and partake in the movement. And there's a picture towards the end of the presentation um, where I was saying to some of the students earlier that a garden, you'll be amazed at what a garden can do. How it can reduce crime, how young people can come out and play in that area. Older people will come out and socialize. It completely changes the community around. Completely changes the community. This is that Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, they feed about 3,000 people a day. And when we first really got the uh, project off the ground, because they went from a project to a pilot to full scale, um, I wanted three things in this closed loop model uh, to be the key ingredient. So the Detroit Zoological Society, we got them to turn over their herbivore manure. We had General Motors and finished a pilot with them collecting data on their food waste from one of their plants where they actually make the Chevy Volt plant. Then we were able to get Blue Cross Blue Shield involved. And so basically what happens on a day-to-day -day within Detroit Dirt is we collect maybe three times a week for most businesses. There's 35 restaurants in the General Motors headquarters from fast food to high-end restaurants. There's 15 to 20,000 people who come in and out of that building every day. Blue Cross Blue Shields cafeterias feed about 3,000. So I finally got my numbers because my mission was to prove that this could work. So once the zoo came on board and we created this closed loop system, we knew that we could help the urban farming community because that that's really what my underlining agenda was, was to help the urban farmers. But I had to create some savvy around how I presented what to who and get permits that didn't exist with the city. <laughs> so I'm not going to say I lied my way through this, but <laughs> I was very creative during the process of how to get this off the ground. And sometimes when you're a revolutionary or a rebel, which a lot of us are in this room, and some of you may not know that that's what you are right now, but I'm telling you, that's what you are, <laughs> you have to be very creative. And once you have that vision, and you know that you're going to help create jobs and help education and impact the community and at the same time impact the environment, because that's what closed loop processes are. They're just making the ecosystem better. That's all it is. You're not really doing anything new, but today you have the opportunity to do something new and take technology and what we know and integrate it into the ecosystem to make it better. We knew when we started off on this path that if we could get corporations and the community to see where we were going, we knew the rest would be history.
So I always, I use this acronym or called C, socially, economically, and environmentally. And it, it's a play on your eyes to see. And socially, we knew that corporations had a responsibility. Economically, we knew that major corporations really don't want to talk to you unless you're talking to them about saving money or helping them to make more money. And that's the same thing, basically, at the end of the day. And so in order to even prove that this concept was something that was viable, I had to collect data for free for the first year, came together with volunteers and other people who wanted to help, and prove that I could show an impact in their triple bottom line. Because I'm like, if you're throwing the food away and there are food banks and homeless shelters that can use this food, and you're also like, your budget's jacked up because you keep ordering food and having a lot of it left over, obviously there's something wrong here. So, and I'm not the first person to say this, but I didn't mean to offend some people along the way. I try to do it as friendly as I possibly could. But at the end of the day, when it's $218 billion, one in seven Americans are food insecure, and there is a homeless shelter down the street, and you don't see anything wrong with that. Whoops, my bad. I'm sorry I had to be the bearer of bad news. And yeah, you have a lot of people within your corporation who make a lot of money, and I'm not saying they're not doing a good job, but they might need to redirect a little bit and think about the budget differently. And once that began to happen, and I could pinpoint within that waste stream, Blue Cross, this month, we got 15,000 pounds of food from you last month. Here are some solutions as to what we can do with this. When those conversations started happening and people started feeling, you know, that this is a real issue, we really can save money. This isn't just about feeling good and doing something that makes us feel good. This is about reducing carbon emissions. This is about changing our carbon footprint. Some of these companies had waste companies trucking their waste 15 and 20 miles outside of the city. Well, that didn't make sense either. For what, why? Why would you send it to the landfill or the incinerator when you have other opportunities or solutions before you even get to that point? So all we were trying to do is help to create strategies that were gonna impact. And for me, it was like, when I think of biodynamic and sustainable designs and integrating different methods, I think about how all of us in this room who do many different things, who have a lot of different careers, but we're all involved in this ecosystem together. But it takes a room full of people like this to really impact or change a community. And that's all we were trying to do in the beginning. It wasn't about money. You know, it really was about to prove that Detroit could survive these economic downturns by looking at how a new economy could be started off of sim something as simple as food waste and agriculture, which was something that we abandoned. And once we knew that if we could advocate and help the urban farmers, change the environmental footprint, create businesses, develop neighborhoods. And we did that in uh, Southwest Detroit. That was like the first, Southwest Detroit was like the first neighborhood that we really helped shift. Because there were a bunch of abandoned parking lots and there were manufacturers in that. It was like an industrial hub. And we went in and created gardens and so they were community gardens. People could come there and get you know, fruits, vegetables, whatever they needed. General Motors, we created a rooftop garden. My whole purpose for that was to show the closed loop process. So when the media came and they're like, oh, 
okay, we see what she's doing. The head chef for one of our most expensive restaurants is going on the rooftop and picking his own herbs and then going back down in the kitchen and using those. It was simple techniques and strategies that we use to help influence and impact the community. Those same docking areas where I take the food waste from were just simply returning that waste back to the landscapers so they can use it for the grounds for landscaping purposes. Closed loop systems are ecosystems. It's as simple as that. Um, and that's what we wanted to promote. We had a city with vacant property, abandoned buildings, and agricultural, agricultural needs. And the agricultural movement was one solution, but it definitely was a pivotal solution for the community. With that said, I just want to talk a little bit about the future and where I think we can go. So we talked about, you know, my journey, how this all came about, how Detroit Dirt, you know, created a closed loop system with three organizations, Blue Cross Blue Shield, the zoo, General Motors, we showed closed loop processes right on the grounds of where we were taking the food waste from. And then Ford wasn't a client, but that ad came about because <laughs> really it was, a, it was a spoof, but it really came about for me personally, when they called and asked me to do that commercial, I'm like, do you have the wrong number? I mean, because why would I? I'm not an actress. I'm an advocate for the environment. So why are, what do you mean do I want to do a commercial? And they're like, well, this jerk that was in this Cadillac ELR commercial didn't really represent the American citizen the way we think that you're doing for Detroit. We want to tell a story of somebody who is real someone that we know that is making change, not someone that lives in a four or five million dollar home talking about how great Americans are. We want someone who represents the people. And when that ad happened, it was one thing to get Detroit behind me and we started pushing for change and there are urban farmers who were doing a great job before I came along. I just wanted to help push the train and help be a part of the movement. But when I got that opportunity to tell my own story and then Ford did something they never do and they launched it online instead of taking it to the TV to see, the, the guy behind the commercial is a genius because he, he, he knew that this was going to happen. He predicted it and he said, let's see who the real people of the world are when we put this thing out and look at the support that we're going to get. And we got a million hits within the first week. And then Time Magazine acknowledged it as one of the top ads in the world. And that was confirmation for me to get out here and talk to people like you about change. Because you believe in it, you're gonna be the game changers. You're the ones in the community who are gonna shift everything. That commercial showed me that. And then I didn't really have much of a personal life after the commercial came out because I was getting calls from people from all over the world. But guess what? There were from teachers who said, I'm showing that ad in my classroom so I can influence these K through eight kids. There were scientists that said, we're used to people with pocket protectors and horn rim glasses talking about composting. You gave you're somebody that's younger, that's making this cool. This is a cool and hip thing. You have an opportunity to impact the world. That was a pivotal moment, that Ford ad. It really was. And then it showed me that there are tons of people out in the world who want to make a difference. And after that ad happened, I had a lot of opportunities. I became a fellow at MIT actually before the ad came out because I didn't even tell, <laughs> tell them about the ad. Um, and I began to think about what were we doing 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 
what would the future look like with technology? And so the end vessel came to mind, anaerobic digestion, all kind of systems started coming up in you know, visions that I had for the future. And the one thing that stuck out for me is how do we scale this model? How do we replicate this model? And it wasn't about me doing everything in the community. It really was about inspiring other people to go, and go oh, oh, I can have a composting company. I can open up a lab. You know, you know, I can do whatever it is that I put my mind to because I wanted them to see that this was a thought, this was my life experience. All of the things that led up to this point, the same thing has happened to you guys in the audience. There are a lot of things that you've done along the way that's gonna help you create whatever it is or invent whatever it is or get the movement going in the community. You just needed to figure it out along the way just like I did. And so what I'm doing currently is raising uh, funds for integrating technology. And this is just one of the vessels that we're looking at. We're looking at many. But if you think about what Three Acres did for two major corporations, only two locations downtown. I'm not talking about all of their locations. I'm not talking about 10 General Motors locations. I'm talking about just the headquarters with those restaurants and Blue Cross Blue Shield and the zoo bringing 20 yards in of material every week. That maximized three acres of land. I get calls every day from restaurants, stadiums, breweries. There are vineyards in the northern part of Michigan. I get calls from everybody who wants to participate in the program. So what we want to do now is we started thinking about what was cost effective and how do we expedite the process of this closed loop system. So the end vessel will give us an opportunity to put like 21 yards in the system. There's a 40% reduction rate. So the output is like 13 yards. We can allow that material to sit for maybe seven days in the machine and process, and then another 30 days in a pile and kind of let it ferment or whatever. But that changes the dynamic completely. So bagging is something that we wanted to do to get this out and distribute it. So the end vessel is gonna be a key component to helping us get that going. It doesn't quite do what the anaerobic system does, you know, but it will help to create more product, faster volumes, and increase the rate in which we uh, cr can create the material. So in the anaerobic, I think that the government and policymakers around the country should, I mean, we should have AD systems in most cities in America. I don't, I know why, because po politically, um, there are people making billions of dollars doing things the wrong way. But any time you can create biogas, heat and electricity, organic compost, change the carbon footprint of a city, all in one system, to me that's mind, it's mind blowing because people are doing this around the world and we're behind. It's time for us to catch up and get with the program. We have to fight for policy that's gonna push AD and end vessel and urban farming. We have to do that. I mean, that's, I mean, to me it's just crazy. The same truck that can go around the city and pick the waste up can be using a biofuel to pick the waste up, bring it back to an area that's one mile, five miles within a like five, 10 mile radius. Never, we shouldn't even be looking at landfills and incinerators. I mean, it's like, 
I, when I go to Hollywood next week, my thing is, can you put this in a movie? Just have compost, J.J. Abrams. Just make a movie <laughs> about compost and just show a bunch of aliens like composting and eating you know, the vegetables and returning it. I don't care what you guys do. I mean, if Star Wars can get billions of dollars, let's start making superheroes into <laughs> composters, you know? Because this is just like, it's just mind boggling. You know, I just can't, I don't know, I'm getting emotional, so <laughs> let me calm down. So preaching the word of composting. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. You know, we have an opportunity to reduce the carbon footprint. You know what I mean? At the same time, pass the torch to the next generation so they can have an opportunity to have a fulfilled life like some of us are going to have. It's our responsibility. People aren't really taking this seriously. You guys are, but it should be three or four hundred of us in this room trying to figure out what we're going to do next. In some places in the country, there are there are there is a turnout of three or four hundred people, and some ten people. When policy is put on the table, sometimes there's twenty people in a room, sometimes there's a hundred. What that says is. Just more of us in the country have to come together and unify and really fight for this thing. That's what it's really about. It's not necessarily about DC making the decision. It's about you making the decision. You have a mayor that showed up at Farm Shed earlier today. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a shift right there. You have a leader, a, a politician, who showed up at Farm Shed. That's like, you know, the clean politician back in the day, the guy with the suit on showing up with the hippies? I mean, that, that, that's a rarity, you know what I mean? So he's telling you that he supports. And he asked me, was I willing to help? I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll call up the, my friends around the country and make sure they get you the information. I'll even have one of them fly in to Stevens Point, if we have to. Yeah. If that's what it's going to take to make change, then let's do it. You know, I mean, because th these are the things, the same mayor that you have today that's looking for change, when it happens, others are going to do what he's doing. Because he decided to step up and work with you guys who are in the room. That's what it's about. I just recently, I just recently went to um, India, and you know I was praying all the way there because I just had a heart procedure at the end of November. And the thing is, it was dangerous for me to get on that long flight, but I'm like, there are some engineering students over there who are waiting for me to help them get to the next level. So. That old saying about dying for the cause, I'm just like, hey, I got to go for it, <laughs> right? If these young people want to see change, then I want to help them do it. And I think that there are too many of us who are thinking that there's not enough of us to, to make the difference, but there are. Because if I can travel halfway around the world and in a city that's the size of this city, had two million people in it, and there was waste, there was cows running around, you know, there are people on motorcycles, and I don't even know how they function, honestly, uh, traffic-wise. They were blowing the horns at each other half the time and running into each other, so, you know, and it's not that I'm making fun of them, it's just that they're just out to survive and do what they have to do. They're not saying they don't want the change or want to look at soil issues and contamination issues, but they need help joining forces because the talent is there. India produces thousands of engineers and they're all over the world. But the thing is, some of us who are experts and you who are in the room who are studying these disciplines and you're focused on soil and soil health, there are emerging markets waiting on you to help here in the States, but also all around the world. They're waiting for you to, to make a contribution. And 
I don't regret going. I'm only at about 80% with my health, but it was all worth it. Because at the end of the day, those students are looking for me to help them. And so when I'm talking about all of the waste and how they can take things that are in their community and make byproducts with it. And at, in the NIT Media Lab, I dealt with some sensor technology that was helping me with um, the soil and understanding bacteria. And we were looking at you know, how the computer and apps can help with soil and growing food. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the future. And we have the opportunity to make, to make a difference. This slide just basically um, talks about, you know, the food that, you know, the solids and the liquids and whatnot, and how AD and N-Vessel to me are just the solution again. And Welltech Bi Biopower, they're out of Germany. They've been building these systems around the world, and they've been making huge strides with uh, their pro projects. And um, for me, it's like the AD system, even it can be, it has its you know, issues. Uh, Michigan State has an anaerobic system for their cafeteria and others that I've seen around the country. And some of these systems, they're just not perfect. No system is. You have to continue to keep working and improving systems. And that's where you guys come in, too, because if you're going to create a compost, it should be based on the needs of what soil issues have. So if you can create some soil amendments through using this technology, it's as, it's as simple as this for me. I started going around and talking to coffee shops and breweries, and they were used to dealing with farmers, which was cool, but the farmers couldn't get there consistently. So I started talking to them about what if we came up with a service model where breweries, coffee shops, anybody that produced or created a material that could help a composting pile, we all could benefit from that. Because you can start organizing those byproducts and then getting them back to the people who need them. So you're creating a whole another system. It's not just about composting. It's also based on farms needed it for feed, roses need uh, coffee grounds. You can do a multitude of things when you start sorting and separating the waste stream and not sending it to the landfill. This just talks about you know, greenhouse gas emissions. And the biggest thing for me with the automotive industry was just showing something that, no, agriculture, I mean, it's only 6.2% and waste is 2.6. But if we can start eliminating um, some of these or reducing these percentages, then we start affecting and impacting the world when all of us are doing this, like G7. These countries are coming together to figure out how they can reduce gas emissions, which is huge. And that involves a lot of things. That's holding, that's setting goals 10 years out, 15 years out. That's holding certain industries accountable for the pollution that they're creating. And some of them are just doing it. They don't even have to be doing that. So it's really about what goals and standards we're going to put in place for the future and start holding people accountable. But I do think that policy plays an important role. I'm just not the person. I have to show my results and then help the guy who's designated to fight for the policy work with him to go to DC. And that's what we want to start doing around the country is those of us who are entrepreneurs and who are industry leaders, we want to help the guy who's pushing the policy. And this is all about policy. This is making people, this is making industry or holding industry accountable. This just breaks down more of the green uh, house gas emissions, the CO2 emissions, uh, transportation, the food consumption. I always tell little kids, 
you know, about meat, chicken, vegetables, and compare that for them so they can see like, oh, if I eat more vegetables, this is what will happen to me, you know? And I was saying earlier at lunch, <laughs> I went in and taught a lot of K through eights about composting, and I swear they're like sponges. I come back and they start asking me questions about soil horizons. And I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> they're like, yeah, the A and B soil horizon in Brazil is compared to, and I'm like, you're in the first grade. <laughs> I'm like, yes, this is working. <laughs> so I mean, to, to go in and talk to them and for them to take it a step further just shows me that they are the future and they're listening and they're ready. They're eager, you know? This is one of the systems that um, we did a little bit of animation with this too, but this is a system that a company in Germany built. But it just talks about processing the feedstock, increasing revenue streams, you know, manure and fertilizer, biogas, just another system. Sustainable management. But I can't push and talk about this enough and how it how it can change for the future. And this is this is the way of the future. The global food crisis. There's enough food for everyone on the planet, but 795 million people still go to bed hungry every night. 30 to 50 percent of all food produced never gets eaten. In 2050, the world will have to feed an estimated 9 billion people in a warmer world, a hotter world, a polluted world, in a warmer world with lower yields. And we have an opportunity to change that. Um, the sustainable food system. I can go on and on and on about why it's broken and how it needs to be fixed and how it's fragmented and the $218 billion wasted. But at the end of the day, if we can start changing our diets and our budgets individually and as corporations, if we can look at advanced technologies and tools that can help us manage all of these processes better, if we can look at farms to grocery stores to dinner tables, the food that never gets eaten, and reducing that food waste, the, the value chain, actually the food supply chain, when I was talking to folks in India, so many of them wanted to work with supply chain, supply chain, and I was like, what about the root of the problem? Because there's only a few of you who are talking about soil contamination. That bothers me. There should be more of you guys who are focused on waste management practices and rebuilding the soils then worry about the food supply chain. Otherwise, you're growing contaminated food or, or crops that are being affected by the soil. So at the end of the day, we're all dealing with problems around the world, with soil, with food, you name it. We have people in California who are doing leaps and bounds around policy and around you know, eliminating waste. Massachusetts banned all of the food waste from going to the landfills. It's amazing what's happening in Massachusetts just because they've banned food from going to the landfill. If you can eliminate 20 or 25 percent of the landfill and do something productive with it, that, that's just a, a no-brainer. We have the opportunity to integrate technology. This is just some of the pending national legislation going on around the country. And I'm really excited because I'm meeting people. The other day I went to a casino. I'll give you an example. MGM, we have three casinos in Detroit, in the city. They're all within blocks of each other, which that's a whole other conversation. But, <laughs> but the point is, Two senators showed up. A couple of them only had maybe 20 or 30 minutes, but they showed up for me. And I didn't know they were going to be there. A couple of state reps, they showed up. Some other leaders from the community. And what they saw was, okay, we have some industry leaders 
who are ready to switch gears. And instead of MGM shipping that waste out like they were, they have an opportunity to invest in technology with someone like me who can work together with them. They're halfway there because they have two or three acres across the street from the casino where they're growing uh, some of their salad mixes and herbs right across the street. So if they just take two more steps and invest in the technology, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a game changer for them, literally. And now that some of these uh, folks who have the opportunity to help you know, influence or change policy are starting to show up around the world, that to me shows change because that wasn't going on three, even two, three years ago. So it's huge. And so the EPA, the USDA, they're putting, uh, creating um, food challenges and having categories for certain uh, people to compete and you know, create data so we can start coming together as a country, uh, which is huge. I mean, that's even two years ago, I'd, the EPA, maybe three years ago in the region that we're a part of, they didn't have any food challenges going on. Now U of M Stadium, Michigan State, colleges, restaurants, people are participating in the movement because they're excited about what's happening and what, how we can Im impact collectively. This is just personal things that we can do. And a lot of you guys in the room, we, I mean, we've already talked about this over the last half an hour or so about what we can do personally. You know, and it's different. Policy reflects different things in certain parts of the world. But if you just start looking at your habits personally, how much you're spending on your food, what you're wasting, uh, turning the lights off, just simple things. Can you ride your bike on Saturday instead of taking your car? Just thinking about how you can do things a little bit different. This community slide shows a little bit of the acreage. Um, but when I was invited, uh, to the White House and winning like a Martha Stewart Award and just all the things that have happened along the way, being recognized by the UN, that really told me that there's a lot more people in the world who are thinking about how we can work towards creating a better world for the next generation. And those little students down at the end, those are the ones who, are, who had questions for me. I had to go back in my, like, two, three years ago on a, a class I took around soils. That's how many questions they had for me where I had to really think about soil horizons and the questions that they have. But this just shows progress. That's on one of the rooftops of General Motors. To have someone like Martha Stewart talk to me about composting in front of hundreds of people. She says she never made any money <laughs> composting, and she kind of envied that. But I'm like, you've made a lot of money doing other things. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> from sheets and cooking wear and dog clothes and wherever else she's got her name licensed for. But she just basically said that she wanted me to win that award because of how she felt about what that meant, like the purpose of that. And that was huge for me because at the end of the day, we're talking about the garden queen of the world, you know, who has a magazine that's all about gardening. And for her to take the time to acknowledge me in the city, which it really wasn't about me, there are a whole lot of other people who are behind me, I play sports, I'm about team efforts, but it was the fact that she acknowledged that that was important. And I don't think they've ever, I don't know if they've really even acknowledged people through American Made that were dealing with agriculture in that way. It's more so crafts and, and design. But now agriculture is huge. And the last two years that I've gone back to that awards, there are people in clothing manufacturing who are starting to think differently. I've been approached uh, by clothing companies that are making t-shirts out of hemp, bamboo, I mean, container, you name it. 
It's happening. If you're thinking about it, as far as from an eco an eco friendly standpoint about products, it's going on. I had a lady. I mean, she made me feel like I was a superstar or something. She's like, take these clothes, wear them when you go out and talk to people. Tell them what it's made of. And she was so excited because she's now selling uh, clothes that are eco friendly in her store, and she wants to continue to scale that because we are what we eat. Our clothes should be important in what it's made out of. All of it is a part of the ecosystem, but the revolution is everybody who's in all these industries are trying to figure out what their contribution is gonna be in the ecosystem. I'm gonna try to close in the next couple of minutes, but this is my mentor, one of my mentors, John Bradburn. He has a 40 acre farm outside the city He's the global waste reduction engineer for General Motors. He's saving them billions of dollars. He is a hero, okay? In my eyes, guys like that, that people don't know, who are behind the scenes making it happen, he helped push the sustainability train for General Motors. Anytime, there's a, there's a couple people in the community who he's mentoring, and another one, they're taking plastic bottles and making uh, sleeping bags and coats for the homeless. So waste is not waste. We gotta even change the language and our, cult our culture should reflect zero waste, but it's the principles and the mindset that we have to begin to change. We have to stop looking at things the way we once looked at them and start looking towards the future because I can show you some super, true superheroes who are taking waste and doing some phenomenal things with it. And John, he's very, a very humble person. But he's taken the Chevy Volt battery covers and the Chevy Volt, turning those into like homes for bats and uh, birds that I'd never even heard of <laughs> in South America and building homes for, for animals that are becoming extinct. I mean, I can tell you tons of stories about the waste stream and the products that are being made from the waste stream. And this guy to me is one of my heroes because he told me years ago, he said, you're gonna, you're gonna be one of the game changers for us. And he said, you just gotta keep doing what you're doing. I know you're not making a lot of money right now. <laughs> but keep believing and, and have the faith. And it was people like him that gave me a chance. And there are other people around the world that will give you a chance, you know, to prove that you can make a difference. Those shipping crates, these were used for a, a, a Korean um, supplier and they used to ship parts in those. And we took maybe five or six hundred, I don't remember. And we placed those in some abandoned parking lots in the southwest of Detroit. Now we got youth groups. That whole community has changed based off of that garden. So it truly has gone full circle. Those are just awards we don't need to talk about. That. <laughs> Ad agencies and other people who I work with think that I'm supposed to share that stuff, but that's not as important, but our vision was to go full circle. And in this last three years, we have been amazed at what has happened. Now I have people calling me and saying, are you interested in, can you help us get a composting program off the ground? We're in Indiana, we're in New York. And I'm like, yeah, I wish I could clone myself. <laughs> so now I need, students like you and others around the country to help, you know, and for us to go out and continue the movement. We, we need to because what you do today and what you're doing here, right here in your home, you, you'll be amazed at how that can affect other people around the world. Everybody teases me because for years, the mantra has been, the soil is the root of the soul. The soil is the root of the soul. 
I go around saying that to my friends and people who are close to me, but I'm really serious because at the end of the day, we're all connected to the soil, every single one of us. So of course your waste management practices are connected to the soil, to the water, to everything, how we live. We're all connected to the soil. This doesn't have nothing to do with gender. I'm not gonna get up here and talk about all the problems that I had as a black woman going into certain rooms. I don't take up the time to talk about that. That's something that just came with the territory. My job is the messenger, is to get out here and share the message with people. Not talk about who lives matter or what women go through, color barriers. To me, at the end of the day, the soil, it connects all of us. So it doesn't matter how rich you are or how poor you are. <laughs> if we don't start doing something today, none of that matters. I had to tell this jerk, excuse me, I want to say another word, but I had to tell him, your money, dude, ain't going to have a damn thing to do with S-H-I-T. I'm taking shit and doing something with it. You need to be doing the same thing because your grandchildren are going to have a completely different life when you're dead and gone. Do you think that your money is, you think you can walk in this room and talk BS to everybody and all oh, this isn't real, this isn't real. It's just because you're not facing the reality. You're not going in places that you don't want to go in. You don't want to tell the truth about what's really going on in the world because you got money, right? So get with the program. We're all connected. And if a crisis happens right now where all these windows are blasted and this, and this building gets demolished, and only a few of us survive, those few people are still gonna have to come up with a way to rebuild this building. So why do we need to wait until a crisis? Why do we need to wait until a crisis happens to start figuring out what we need to do? With that said, in conclusion, I would like to say Thank you to Rob, all of you in this audience, this community. Half the time I'm so tired because I'm exhausting myself, but you made it worth it to me. The questions you are asking, the conversations that we were having, for me that, that makes it worth it. I would never, this is how I want to live my life. If it means not taking the job for unlimited dollars for a major corporation so they can brag and say we bought her out or sold her out. I'm not going to do that. My job is to continue to do what I'm supposed to do. And that's help young leaders, that's help other people in communities come together for what's right, to make, it, to make an impact. That's what I want to do. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I feel like my purpose is. So I'm not gonna abandon that. So I'm so grateful to be standing in front of you, especially people like you who care. I mean, <laughs> it started in Detroit, in a city that had a bunch of you know, abandoned buildings and vacant land. And I started seeing people who, who really cared and wanted to make a difference. And now I'm meeting people from all over the world who wanna do that. There's nothing better for me than for some college student or to go on a, on a university campus and for them to tell me that they want to make a contribution, then I'm doing my job. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk to you, to share this time. You know, I'll continue to send positive vibrations to you guys that you continue on your journeys to do whatever it is you want to do to make a contribution in this ecosystem. And remember, if a General Motors could take a chance on somebody crazy like me, there are other people out there who are willing to take a chance on you all. They're out there. You just have to be willing to commit your time to it. And whatever that is, if you have a full-time job, allocate the time that you can do something. 
We don't, we, we all are represented differently within that ecosystem, but we're all in it together. We just have to figure out who can do what when, and, and it's in this room. So don't let me come back here in a year and you guys haven't done anything. But I know, I know that you are, but thank you. I appreciate your time and we can open it up for uh, Q&A if anybody has any questions.